Get ready for the Run It Again podcast. Huddle up! Huddle up! Every week, you'll be hearing stories that take you beyond the daily sports grind with unique insight from former NFL star and broadcaster Ron Pitts. Just feels like the college football season discussion gets more and more complicated. And the mastermind behind the greatest show on turf, Super Bowl winning coach Mike Martz. I do think professional sports has such an impact on the American psyche that I think everybody's going to want to try and get this up and running in some version of it. We'll connect you directly to the source and tell you what's really going on. The biggest issue is, and I think this is important, is they're not exposed to family either. Oh boy, that's going to be interesting. With conversations and tales from guys on the inside. It's run it again. We settled in the second half and started to run the football better. You've got to get control when it goes hot like it did today. <laughs> We're trying to put you in a position so that you can be evaluated doing NFL stuff. Composure. Focus on the details. And when you get the details done with a great attitude. Everybody! Everybody! Go Everybody! Go Everybody! Go Mike Tom. From 1999 to 2001, St. Louis was the center of the football universe. Thanks to an explosive offense that revolutionized the NFL. Dick Vermeil began building an offensive machine. The first step was handing over the controls to an unproven play caller. It was his first opportunity to be an offensive coordinator, and nobody, in my opinion, in the history of the league, came into an organization and made the contribution he made. St. Louis needed to upgrade its offense. Vermeil began by hiring Redskins quarterback coach Mike Martz to serve as his offensive coordinator. The Rams signed Trent Green, who had flourished under Martz in Washington. We will rally around Kurt Warner, and we'll play good football. You throw conventional rules out the window when you're trying to defend St. Louis because they'll throw at any time. There's no normalcy to what they do. You better be able to adjust. You better be able to to change things on the fly because if not, it's going to be a long day. We will come out on the first series, first play with four wide receivers. Most teams would do that on third down every once in a while. From 1999 to 2001, no team completed more balls for more yards or more touchdowns. 1999 had turned into a fairy tale, and for the Rams' offense, a wizard named Mike Martz was writing the script. Mike Martz was very much responsible for uh, our success, along with all the coaches. But as an offensive coordinator, you have more responsibility. I told Mike when he came there, I was going to turn it over to him. Time you got a chance. I appreciate it. What you have the ability to be, just go ahead and do it. I appreciate it. I do. When Mike was calling plays, he used to startle me sometimes. He'd do things coming out of our own area in the field that I wouldn't have done. Oh, Michael, 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 down here? Jeez, good luck. I'd say, oh, my God, Mike, what uh, what are you doing? Bang, and it would work. That's one of the reasons we became so explosive offensively, because we had no fear. Martz's offense would be called the greatest show on turf, a scoring spectacular. This game's all about scoring points, guys. we got to score some points. World championships are all about. Now we battle. Couldn't ask for a better script. Let's go win it right now. You know, we called the play. The play was 999, uh, which was basically all goes. You know, all four of our receivers were going to just run straight down the field. Water back to throw. Rainbow's the far sideline. team in the world. The St. Louis Rams are the world champions. Dick Vermeil stepped down as the Rams head coach. His position was quickly filled by offensive coordinator Mike Marks. In 2000, the Rams became the first NFL offense to gain over 7,000 yards in a season. They also scored 540 points, the most points scored by any team in Rams franchise history. Kurt Warner has a broken finger. He is done for today. It's a shame that Kurt got hurt in the seventh game at Kansas City. That offense was mind-boggling. Through six games, it averaged 44 points. It was on pace. And keep in mind, this is not two or three games. It's 40% of the season. They were on pace for 698 points. 
they were on pace for more than 8,000 total yards and 6,000 passing yards. I really believe had Kurt stayed healthy, that offense in 2000 would have obliterated just about every team offensive record for a single season on the books. We felt that we were better than we performed the year before. You could definitely make an argument that the 0-1 team was the best of all of them. The St. Louis Rams are Super Bowl bound for the second time in three years. The Rams are champions of the National Football Conference. I still believe that that collection of talent and what we accomplish consistently as the greatest show on turf, that it's the best offense that the NFL has ever seen. And we ushered in a new era of football that everybody's playing now. Welcome back to the Joel Orient Show. Walk into my plan and you're going to win, win, win. Winner.com. On 92 on the team. All right, let's bring in our next guest. He is the professor of pass. He's the orchestrator of offense. He's the architect and the ringmaster behind the greatest show on turf. He has a coaching record of 53 and 32. Three playoff victories underneath his belt. He coached in three NFC Championship games, two as an OC, one as a head coach. He won a Super Bowl in 1999 as the offensive coordinator of the St. Louis Rams, got to a Super Bowl as a head coach in 2001 with the St. Louis Rams. He started out his coaching career at Bullard High School in Fresno, California. He then coached at San Diego Mesa College, San Jose State, Santa Ana College, Fresno State, Pacific, Minnesota. He was at Arizona State from 1983 to 1991. He then joined the Los Angeles Rams in 1992 as an offensive assistant. He was the quarterback's coach in 97 and 98 with the Washington Redskins. Then joined the St. Louis Rams as the offensive coordinator in 99. He became the head coach in 2000, was with the Rams until 2005, then was the OC of the Detroit Lions in 06 and 07. He was with the San Francisco 49 in 2008, the Chicago Bears in 2010 and 2011, and most recently the head coach of the San Diego Fleet in the AAF. He is also co-host of a great podcast, the Run It Again podcast. His co-host, Ron Pitts, former Buffalo Bills and Green Bay Packers player. Ron also was a play-by-play and color analyst for Fox on NFL Games for many years. And if you are a helmet head, you're going to want to subscribe, download the podcast, run it again. It is a great listen. Let's bring them on. It's Coach Mike Martz. Coach, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Coach, we're in western New York here. We are in Bill's country, immersed in Bill's mafia. So wanted to bring someone on with a national perspective, unbiased. McDermott just signs a six-year extension. They get to the playoffs for the second time in his three years. They come up short last year against the Houston Texans. What do you expect? What is your thoughts on the Buffalo Bills going into this year? I think they're a real good team. They're going to be very good this year. I think that adding Stephon Diggs is a is a huge sign for them. Um, I, I think it will impact their running game immensely. Not so much that they're going to throw the ball to him a lot, because I don't believe they will. His big playability, it changes coverages. And when you change coverages, it makes it easier uh, to run the football. They've got to get that eighth defender out of the box, even though – Singletary was averaging like 5.1 yards a carry. Can you imagine with one less defender in there because of the threat of a guy like mm-hmm. Diggs? And Bronx was a good player, too. So just the threat of him out there and being able to make big plays will alter some of the coverages and allow them uh, the ability to have more success running the ball, I believe. On a phone with us, Coach Mike Martz won a Super Bowl with the St. Louis Rams in 1999 as the offensive coordinator. And, Coach, when you were normally brought in, it was by a defensive coordinator head coach, a defensive-minded head coach, and they wanted you to run the offense. You had Vermeil as your head coach in St. Louis. You had Marinelli with the Detroit Lions. You had Mike Nolan with the San Francisco 49ers. You had Lovey Smith with the Chicago Bears. How hard is it as an offensive coordinator to have a defensive-minded coach who might be more conservative than you? Or is it better to have a defensive-minded coach because he's not necessarily getting as involved in the play calls as maybe an offensive-minded head coach would be? It never really mattered. Actually, Dick was running the offense before I got there. I think... um 
the biggest issue is that you don't put guidelines or restrictions on what they can do and just <laughs> trust that you go with the talent that you had. Because each year, the teams are personalities. Mm-hmm. And as you change that personnel, uh, that personality changes and will can take in different directions. And I know he wants to run the ball effectively, <laughs> and they've done a pretty good job of that. But you know those... You know, for three straight years there, uh, we were uh, in the top five um, rushing and in the top ten for about five straight years. So people don't realize we ran the ball very well. Yep. But um, the point is the passing game got all the attention. Now, I think the play action stuff will help immensely mm-hmm. uh, with, with Stephon there. Yeah, he's a big play receiver. And they just have got to be able to come out and, and uh, put the ball down the field a little bit more on first down. I always found this interesting. It's so easy to call a play from the couch or your comfy chair and even from the booth if you're doing a game on TV or radio. But when you're an offensive coordinator, how far in advance are you with your play calling? Do you wait until the play is done to decide what you're going to run next? Or in your mind, you already know, okay, it doesn't matter what this play is going to do. I'm going to go with this next play no matter what. Or... Does the play you called have to get X amount of yards for you to go with play A? Or if it only gains a certain amount of yards, you're going to then go with play B? Because that play clock goes fast, coach, and you want to have enough time to get the play into the quarterback for them to get to the line and then for the quarterback to audible out if he needs to, depending on the defense. Before the ball's even snapped, I'm on to the next play with uh... – <laughs> you know, the different alternatives based on what happened to that play. And a lot of times I feel real confident about that play. And I already have something that you want to, you know, that you want to call almost regardless, you know. So uh, you, you have to be at least a full down ahead. Uh, a lot of times I don't even see the ball snapped, you know. Um, and then you look up and you see the defense. And that's why I sit on the field. But you always a, a play ahead. You can't have somebody in your – you know, we had everybody turn their, their mouthpieces off. Right. So you don't have any information coming at you. Okay. You just got to be able to focus. Sure. You know, that's, that's how I did it. That's not right. the right way. That's <laughs> just how I did it. Well, sure. Nothing wrong with that. Got you 53 wins. Got you to three NFC Championship games. Got you a Super Bowl ring. Got you to a second Super Bowl as a head coach. On the phone with this coach, Mike Martz. He is the co-host of the great podcast, Run It Again podcast i encourage you to subscribe download it if you are a helmet head it is a great listen coach there's pros and cons to being the head guy being the head coach you have autonomy you have control over everything and then there's pros and cons to being just the offensive coordinator where you can just worry about the offense. Did you prefer one over the other, being the head coach or the offensive coordinator? Well, I enjoy just being involved in the offensive, but I will qualify that by saying that um, as an offensive coordinator, I was always very, very tuned in to you know, each week our defense, you know, the, the issues they may have, mm-hmm. how good that team was in offense, and you have, to, you have to work off of each other. Now, we became a dominant team on offense, so what we did – and it worked well for us, and, and Dallas had done this at times before us. We came out and just went hot and heavy, hard and fast as we could, and got points on the board. Came out of the second half and just slowed the game down and grounded into the dirt. And when you play from a lead, it's, it's e- much easier to put your defense in such a good situation because they, you got teams that don't want to really throw the football, having to throw the football, right. and then you've, you've taken control. So we try to control the game that way, but. Yeah. We could do that. Now, Buffalo is not uh, a good comfort behind team. They haven't been. It's just yep. not who they are. Uh, I think that just the addition of Diggs, um, and I, I like the running back from Utah they picked up. I don't remember mm-hmm. his name. But, uh, you know, that one-two punch at running back. Singletary's a real good player. Yep. They just have got to, you know, continue to do. They've got a great theme on, on how they're doing this. Mm-hmm. Allen's just got to get a little bit more uh, – productive in terms of uh, his percentages and you know those things but he's learning yep. and he's going to play real well they're they're really i think they're going to win that thing to be honest with you. i think they're real good Yep, so I want to turn back the clock a little bit and talk about your time with the Rams. You took over as head coach of the Rams in February of 2000, and your first draft, you guys had the opportunity to draft this gangly senior quarterback from Michigan named Tom Brady. Instead, you guys drafted a safety with the 198th overall pick, Matt Bowen. Brady went 199th, and to be fair, Brady was
was embroiled in that quarterback controversy at Michigan with Drew Henson. Certainly nobody foresaw the reign of terror that he would unleash on the NFL. And Mark Bulger, the guy who you guys ended up picking up in 2000, was a good quarterback in his own right. He had some really solid years for the Rams, made a couple of Pro Bowls. I believe he was the fastest quarterback in NFL history to reach 1,000 completions. But anyway, what did you guys think of Tom Brady during the draft process? And were there any thoughts of drafting him one pick before he was taken? Well, we had two quarterbacks, Trent Green, right. who had a great career, and he, he had just come back. You know, so we were going to get him back that year, yeah. and we had this guy named Kurt Warner who was kind of a newbie <laughs> on the scene. So we had Green, who was a terrific quarterback, and we had Warner who was a great quarterback. We had those two quarterbacks. Yeah. No, we were not the quarterback. Yeah. At that point, um, I, I, I do have my report on, on him. I felt <laughs> like you know, I wrote him up as a second round uh player, but that doesn't make any difference. Right. I thought he was a real good player and, and uh you know, we lost track of him because we just we had no need of a quarterback. You know, he had two of them, and we weren't sure where, whether we were going to keep Green or not. But right. he had two guys that are basically Pro Bowl quarterbacks, and you know, you're not going to draft another quarterback with that. Yep. Plus, at that point in that draft, I was in the hospital. I was having my uh, uh. my neck fused. I forgot about that. That's right. I forgot about that whole situation for you during uh, that time. On the phone with us is Mike Martz. And, Coach, you and Kurt Warner are tied for the rest of history with your success in St. Louis with the Rams and the greatest show on turf. But I think now people look back and say, geez, what were the Rams thinking? What was Coach thinking getting rid of Warner? Because he had so much left. After he left with the Rams, he went to New York. He got the Giants to 5-4. and four. Then Coughlin benches him, puts in Eli. The rest is history in New York. Kurt then goes to Arizona, has several good years with the Cardinals, getting them to a Super Bowl, very close to winning a Super Bowl with the Cardinals, and rightfully so now in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I think people forget that it isn't that you guys just decided to move on from Kurt. He had broken his thumb, I think, if I remember correctly, in 2 and he really struggled. I think he was 0-6, three touchdowns, 11 interceptions. So you had to salvage a season. So you benched Kurt and you brought in Mark Bolger, who got very hot. So I think people forget it wasn't something like you guys just decided you wanted to go with the young guy and you were just going to bench the old guy and, and you thought he was washed up. To me, it seemed like that thumb injury really hurt Kurt's play, and he was having a hard time recovering from that while in St. Louis. You know, he got hurt um, against Dallas. I think it was the you know, third or fourth game of the season. Um, he broke his thumb yep. and, uh, you know, went out then. We put Mark in, and actually Mark was our third quarterback, yep. and he, Mark just kind of took off and had a terrific year. And, mm-hmm. And then, uh, uh, but we when he started against the Giants, he had a concussion. We thought he had a concussion, oh. and I, I kept him out. Uh, they said no, he's fine, but okay. he just wasn't right to me. So we kept him out. And Mark got caught far, so we we won like nine out of eleven or ten games or whatever it was there. And I just felt like at that point, um, you know, his thumb. You know, I wasn't smart enough to put a glove on his hand like uh, the Cardinals did. Right. I didn't know to do that, and. You know, I kept asking the doctors, and they they said surgery is a 50-50 deal, and it's his choice, and he didn't want to have the surgery. And you know, I just, you know, we were 0-6 with him or 0-7, whatever it was, and he was struggling, and, and he had a big signing bonus in June, and they wanted to know, you know, what to do. And, right. and it was a big dilemma. Yeah. So, Mark, we'd won 12 games with Mark, and it just um, – it was a very difficult decision, yeah. and whether it was right or wrong at sure. this point doesn't make any difference right. one that we made. Well, listen, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You did what you thought was right at the time for your team, and you've got to think of the whole, you know, fifty three man roster. You can't think of just one guy. You've got to put the team first, and I'm sure it was a very hard decision. You and Kurt you know, had a very close relationship. I want to get your thoughts on Sean McDermott, the Buffalo Bills head coach, in his, coming into his fourth season. He's 25-23 and 23 overall. He's 0-2 in the playoffs. 
and they just gave him a six-year extension, and that's got to be a relief for those guys on that staff to know they have a little bit of time now. They're not lame duck coaches going into the last year of their contracts. They've got six years. They've got time to implement their system, to build this program, and not only get into the postseason, because they've done that now twice, but to get that elusive playoff win, the first in franchise history since 1995. It is, but, you know, I don't. as a coach, I'm sure he... Sean is this way too. You don't think about those things. You know, once you're, once you start coaching, it's uh, it's day to day. You know, doesn't make any difference what you did in the past. Mm-hmm. It's, it's what you do today and their approach. And the biggest issue is having, uh, you know, this whole game is is based on talent and personnel. Sure. And to have a chance at it, you've got to have good personnel, the right personnel, and you have to be able to adapt to what you have. And that's it. Yep. That's it. And if you don't have real good personnel, and there's some teams in the league that no matter what they do because of their roster, right. they're not going to win. They're just not. Right. And you know, their personnel, uh, whoever does the personnel there has done a great job with it. Mm-hmm. And as long as he's got input to that, and so he's got the right of refusal on mm-hmm. you know, uh, bringing somebody in or, or, or removing somebody from the roster, then I think he'd be happy with that. But <laughs> that's your lifeblood. And having a say-so in personnel as a head coach, right. is, 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 you got to have that. On the phone with his coach, Mike Martz. He is the co-host of the Run It Again podcast. Uh, you can download that, subscribe, get it in the iTunes store, rate, review. If you're a helmet head, it is a great podcast. Certainly comes from a totally different and unique perspective. Him and his co-host, Ron Pitts. Okay, coach, you made it to three NFC Championship games. 99, you win the Super Bowl with the Rams as the OC. You get the Rams back to the Super Bowl as a head coach in 01. You're a 30-yard field goal kick away by Jeff Wilkins uh, to get to another NFC Championship game uh, in 03. You get to the NFC Championship game in 2010 as the offensive coordinator for the Lovey Smith led Chicago Bears with Jay Cutler as quarterback. So, as I mentioned, McDermott's 25 and 23 overall, 0 and 2 in playoffs. So, we wanted to take a little bit more of a deep dive into his record and his numbers okay so i'm gonna give you a couple categories you tell me what category is the most meaningful okay so uh record against teams with a 500 or better record record at home record on the road record against winning teams at home record in games decided by one possession or less record in games decided by one possession or less at home or Is it just the overall record? If you're a GM or you're a head coach, what is the most important stat for you? What do you look at? The overall record. The overall record. Uh, You you know, come on. I mean, all these stats, and (laughs) you obviously are the new gen, uh, (laughs) you know, with all these numbers and all that stuff. So it comes down to how guys play. You know, uh, every week it, it changes. And to think that, well, here's a for instance for you. We played Carolina in 01, mm-hmm. and I think we were beating them 42 or 49 and nothing and a half. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we substituted second half, and they left and went home. We played them again at the end of the year, and we stopped them on the 10 yard line or the 20 yard line at the end of the game to keep from beating us. And mm-hmm. I think we won whatever it was, but it was like 42 35 or whatever. But, um, a different team. You don't know anybody can beat anybody on any Sunday, and I know people hear that and they say they don't really believe that, but it's right. true. Yeah, it's true. And you've got to come to play. So it doesn't make any difference whether you're home or on the road. You know, we we were at the time we were only the second team in history to go undefeated on the road during the regular season. And wow. I won. Wow. What does that mean? Yeah. It doesn't really mean much of anything. If right. you're not in the playoffs or the Super Bowl, who cares? So. Right. <laughs> I just want to see how they play sure. on a okay. week week. You know, peaks and valleys yeah. are important to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the road thing is, is probably uh, an important issue, but um, you have to be able to win on the road to, to win a championship. There's no question. Uh, so let's talk about the AFC East. So you, you mentioned you really like the Bills. Uh, you know, the the Patriots, of course, uh, you know, they're always been at the top. Now it's Cam and, and Jared Stenham. I believe Cam is is the leader in the clubhouse to be the quarterback, although there's some question if, you know, he can run the type of offense they want to run. I would think they would adapt to him a little bit this year, even if he's just kind of this in-between bridge to Stidham uh, of the future. 
Um, what is your thoughts on the Patriots? I know a lot of people are a little bit down on them, especially with some of their major players opting out this year. Well, he's Bill's best coach in the league, has been for a long time, and he figures out the best way to win every week. Um, he will take away whatever you do well, he's going to take it away. And he's going to do everything he can and force you to play a game you don't want to play. Yep. Uh, Cam will go there and be a different quarterback. Yep. And he won't have a choice. Right. Uh, what he'll do is he'll go there and he'll have to adapt. And this adapting to Cam and what he does best mm-hmm. is there's a little bit to that, but he will learn the game of football yep. and he will be disciplined and operate within that system. And then when things break down, he can make a play, but he's not going to freelance and do some of the stuff he's done in the past. He's they, whether he can do that or not remains to be seen. Uh, but that's what they're, I believe that's what they'll approach. And then there's some things they'll do for him because of his unusual ability. But, uh, you know, he's going to be one, he's going to be one of 11, not 10 plus one. Right. And that's the whole thing there. So, I think they'll win. I think they'll be very good because that's who he is. Um, he's a great coach. Um, but I do think the Bills will be the new kid on the block. Yep. Uh, so then uh, the Jets, I know, I believe you coach with G- Adam Gaze, I think in San Francisco real quickly. <clears throat> uh, I know some people are, you know, Jet fans don't think he's the answer. Him and Donald uh, haven't progressed as much as I guess they would like them to see. And then Miami. So how would you rank the AFC and, and those other two teams that I just mentioned? Well, Adam uh, was an off- uh, worked in the office when I was at Detroit. Okay. okay. And he wanted to become a coach. He wasn't coaching. He didn't play football. So I grabbed him, made him a quarterback coach, and took him with me to San Francisco. And, you know, so so I know Adam real well, very close to him. Uh, I think he's a terrific coach. Uh, they, those people that say that are wrong. Okay. I think they do have some personnel issues. They've got to get ironed out. I think they will be up and down. He's the perfect guy for that quarterback there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Miami, um, it kind of is an enigma to me. I just, uh, I, I think the, the rookie uh, is going to be real good for him, mm-hmm. but it'll take some time. For this season, uh, it's a toss up between those two. I think the Bills will be at top. I think it's the Bills, uh, New England, and then either one of those two. Yep. Uh, so when, when we look at it with this pandemic and no preseason, when you look at a guy like Adam Gase or McDermott, who's, you know, only in their third, fourth, fifth year, maybe as a head coach, compared to Belichick. Can Belichick have a distinct advantage just because of his experience and his time and maybe his connections with Saban and college coaches who don't have a preseason? Or is everybody basically at the same disadvantage with no preseason and the lack of practicing and that's not going to be a advantage to Belichick or some of these senior coaches? It just kind of depends really on how you use that time. He'll use every second of it uh Preciously, if you will, yep. and I think the other guys will probably try to do the same thing. But I think that without a preseason, I think coaches are forced to have live scrimmages now right. to be able to evaluate. So you'll have inter squad scrimmages that will really appear to be almost preseason games. You have to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know you might have to have at least two of those right. um, to be able to cut your team. And if you don't have them, I don't know how you cut your team because right. you can't evaluate some of the guys. So. It, it's what you do with that time. Uh, if you use it very wisely and you choreograph what you have to choreograph to get a vision of what these guys are, mm-hmm. uh, he'll he'll take advantage of that. Hopefully the other guys will as well. On the phone with the Super Bowl winning coach, Mike Martz. And coach, this year is going to be different for a lot of reasons. But one reason, some stadiums might be empty. Some stadiums might be at 25% capacity. Now, some stadiums might pump in crowd noise, but I wanted to get your thoughts on the lack of crowd noise. We hear from Greg Popovich, the San Antonio Spurs head coach in the bubble, that it's weird because with it being so quiet, when he yells, set a high pick, not only his players can hear it, but the opposing coach and players can hear what he's saying. Is that going to be an issue and problem in the NFL for communication between the sidelines and the quarterback and what the quarterback is saying to, you know, his guys that the defenders can hear that better and the opposing coaches can hear that better or won't that matter? It doesn't matter. You have that you have the voice to the linebacker on defense and the voice to the quarterback on offense. Uh, so you can get your message across there. Um, the stuff at the line of scrimmage in your own division, you play those guys twice a year, you've right. been doing it for years, so you, you, you know those guys that are playing, they hear it anyway. Right. So it's not, I don't think it's an issue. Uh, right. You know, if you have to get some information from the sideline, you wag it into somebody. Yep. And, 
you know, they've come close to the numbers there. You can yell at them. The other guys, <laughs> you know, you give some of these guys too much credit. Right. They're just trying to, <laughs> you know, coach their guys and stay ahead a little bit. They're in, if they're focused on what you're saying on the sideline over there, they get behind real right. quick. Yeah. And, and you've gone into some, I mean, it was tough to go into the, you know, the, the Dome in St. Louis and play you guys. It was loud. Tough to go to St. Uh, to uh, Seattle. Without fans, do you think that will negate um, home field advantage and do the players feed off of that? I mean, I knew I know they do it in Major League Baseball when it's a hundred and two, one hundred sixty two game season. It's a marathon, and when you're playing a night day game or a double header, you know you need to, those fans to kind of pick you up. I don't know if it's the same in football. I know you guys, you know, practice in domes and bubbles sometimes, and you blare the music to prepare to go on the road. So, do you think not having fans will affect either the road team? Uh, now it's going to be maybe a little quieter, or the home team where they're not going to have that home crowd necessarily to maybe feed off of some. It's hard to say. I, you know, it's a good point. I don't, I don't know. I think that uh, the logic would say that it, it puts the home team at a bit of a disadvantage, takes advantage away from them, rather. Yeah. We always felt like, uh, and we talked to players like this, when we went on the road, mm-hmm. we enjoyed, we looked forward to the noise from the fans, you know, the booze and stuff. That just absolutely cranked us up. Right. And the players loved it, and uh, they welcomed <laughs> it. So I don't. I don't. In terms of that, we never. I never played music or, or stuff mm-hmm. over the deal very much because the players could hear anyway. <laughs> right. um, that's more of a coach's deal than anything else. Yeah. So um, I think it probably evens things out a little mm-hmm. bit. Just the travel, I think, is probably the biggest disadvantage. But whatever advantage the home team had at that point, then right. other than the travel, is probably diminished. Uh, sure, Tanner, jump in. Ask your last question here for Coach uh, Mike Martz, co-host of the Run It Again podcast. You can get it wherever podcasts are available. Speaking of the Run It Again podcast. That you do with Ron Pitts. How did you get into podcasting? You know, Ron and I did uh, Fox. We we did a lot of games for the uh, you know for, for Fox. You know, the, especially on the East Coast out there. And I got to know Ron before that, but we became partners and good friends. And he'd mentioned that he wanted to do a podcast. Well, I you know a few years ago I didn't know what it was and <laughs> wasn't whole really interested in it. But he got you know he was persistent about it. And we got to talking about it. So. You know, you, when you listen to some of the, the stuff that's out there, given a different perspective from a guy who's played the game uh, and a, somebody who's coached the game, might be fun to do. So that's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to give a different perspective, perhaps, and, and what's out there already. Coach, before we cut you loose, I want to ask you, your last job was with the San Diego Fleet and the AAF as the head coach. Unfortunately, that league was not able to sustain. The XFL might come back around after Dwayne Johnson bought it in a year or two, but your name is always in the mix for offensive coordinator jobs or head coaching jobs in the NFL. You seem to be in great shape and in great health. You're as sharp as a tack. You sound as young and spry as ever. You're a young man at heart, and it looks like physically as well. And is there any opening, is there a window that you might be willing and open to come back to the sidelines, whether it be a head coach or offensive coordinator in the near future? You know, I'd never say no. Um it just depends on the circumstances and where it is and, and all that. You know, the the team that I did was in San Diego, and I'm living in San Diego, so that was an easy deal for me. And uh, there's a lot of connections locally there for me. And, and uh, I felt like it – I felt like the AAF had a heck of a chance. And it was really, really a shame yeah. that they, they couldn't make it. But I do know this. There's a huge need – for that love of football, yeah. you know, it's to bridge from college football or even guys that can't get into college and still have the ability to play mm-hmm. some sort of league that can develop young talent for the NFL. I, there's a big need there. I agree with you. And what I don't understand is there's been uh, reports and you, uh, anonymous um, sources in the NFL that they they don't seem to feel like they want a farmer feeder system that they don't need that. But you look at the you know the uh, Major League Baseball they you, they use the minor leagues the A Double A Triple A uh, G League uh, in the NBA that has become more popular. Uh, it just seems uh, the NFL seems to look at it, Mike, as competition. When if it's in the spring, to me, if you're an NFL coach, wouldn't you love to be able to in the spring watch a league like that and see some guys and say, hey, this guy could fill a need for us on our roster? 
Oh, there's no question. But here's the two things. Number one, they do not want to damage the relationship they have with college football, which right. is really extensive. <laughs> right. and, and by sponsoring a league like that, they I think they are really concerned about their relationships with uh, college football. Okay. Number two, they don't want to spend the money. Right. <laughs> and it's unfortunate. And for that league, for a league to make it, they have got to basically uh, fund some of it to some extent, whether they provide officials or venues or they've got to become involved and perhaps provide practice squad players in the mm-hmm. spring for their rosters and, and, and allow it. They don't have to run it or control it, but they can at least uh, be right. cooperative with it and help it. And I think it would help them immensely. We had four from that league uh, in the Super Bowl in 01. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Four starters, yes. Coach, thank you so much. Continued success and health to you and your family. Oh, thanks very much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. It was fun. All thank right. You. There you go. Coach Mike Mart, Super Bowl Winning coach 1999, got to the Super Bowl in 2001 as a head coach of the Rams, got to the NFC Championship game as the offensive coordinator of the Chicago Bears in 2010. And he is the co-host of the Run It Again podcast. You can download, subscribe that, get that in your iTunes store, rate, review. It is a great podcast. They give you a unique perspective and insight with Coach Martz and Ron Pitts, former NFL player for the Buffalo Bills and the Green Bay Packers, and Ron did games for Fox for many years. It really does fit a hole in the market uh, when you're talking about a football podcast, especially for you helmet heads out there that just can't get enough football. It's 92 on the team. We'll be back on the flip side.